welcome in this theater where 600 people should be sitting. You should be sitting here. But unfortunately, I'm on my own. But I'm happy that you are watching. Welcome to the first debate of the Etienne Vermeer's chair in this beautiful theater, which is called the Vooruit. And we are in Ghent, in Belgium. My name is Desiree Hoving, and I'm your host for tonight. What are we going to do? We are going to debate the question, climate change is real, and what should we do about it? So, it's time to introduce you to the panel. But first, I have another question for you, because I'm curious, when you saw the title of this debate, climate change is real, what should we do about it? What was the first thing you thought about? What should we do about it? I think when I wake you up in the middle of the night, you think of one or two words, you have an answer, you must have an answer. Jocelyn says, call it a crisis. Stop to focus on economic growth. That's one of the points, uh, one of the poll questions coming up later. Stop eating animals, have less children. Ooh, I think that's not on our, our agenda. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, uh, experts, when you're listening, you can uh, comment on that. Forbid ads. <laughs> Lovely solution. Okay, thank you so much. I hope you can see each other's uh, chats as well, because I really like what you are saying. And I really like our panel to reflect on, on some of the things they heard. So let's ask our panel of, of international climate champions, I would call them, uh, what they think of all your answers. I hope you, they, they understood what I uh, said. Our first panelist, panelist is um, Paulina Dube. She's a professor of environmental science at Botswana University and lead author of several um, IPCC reports. And she's joining us all the way from Botswana and Southern Africa. Welcome, Paulina. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay. Hi, and I see all the rest. I see you waving. Can I have a, uh, can it be a little bit louder? Because I hardly can hear uh, Paulina. Uh, Paulina, uh, when you, uh, did you hear the, the answers that people gave to, as, as solutions for climate change? Did you hear them? Yes, I, I heard it. I heard them from you. Yes, thanks. Um, wh what answer, um, what did you think was a good answer? Was an interesting uh, answer? There, there is no good answer. All of those answers together uh, are, are required to, to face the climate change challenge. Yes, yes. Including, reduction, including the reduction of population. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Paulina, for now. Um, our second panelist is Ted Nordhaus, and uh, Ted is from the en American Environmental, uh, I should say he is an um, American Environmental Policy Expert and Director of the Breakthrough Institute. Um, you are joining us all the way from California in the United States of America. Welcome, Ted. When you uh, saw the title of this uh, event, what, what was the first thing you thought about? I, I thought that your um, your question and the, the answers you went through were really interesting, right? Because the very first thing is call it a crisis. Um, and then you get a huge, big list of um, ideas, agendas, um, uh, many of them uh, at the very least, not entirely consistent with one, one another. Um, and this, this really defines the climate issue. Um, call it a crisis, justifying um, whatever your sort of ideological, political worldview priors are uh, on it. So, so the crisis justifies whatever you believe the world should look like and the sorts of solutions to most problems, all problems are, whether it's reducing population or investing in technology or degrowing the economy. So this is, this is what sort of climate change, uh, you know, as a problem is, and it's what makes it such a difficult problem to address is that um, it's uh, in some ways sort of so poorly defined and so 
entwined with, with everything that sort of everything becomes the solution. Thank you, Ted, for now. Um, our third panelist is Mark Linus. He's an environmental activist, science journalist, and author of the book Our Final Warning, Six Degrees of Climate Emergency, translated as Ses Graden here in uh, Belgium. Um, when you heard um, uh, the answers uh, of the people at home to the question, uh, how should we, um, what should we do about climate change, what did you think? Um, well, someone's, I think the first one, as Ted mentioned, was call it a crisis or call it crisis. Um, I call it an emergency, um, and that's why I title my book that. Uh, I think it's a stronger, uh, a, a stronger word than crisis. Um, it's something that we that we can't avoid and that we have to tackle in, in short order or, or face catastrophic consequences. Um, and I'm sure most of us are in agreement about that, whatever word we, we choose to use. Um, regarding the other responses, some of them I think are false dichotomies. So I don't think we have to choose between lifestyle change and technology innovation. I think those tend to reinforce and drive one another. And some things you do have to choose between. We can't have growth and degrowth in the same place at the same time. We can't have nuclear energy and not nuclear energy. So some things you maybe do need to make some difficult choices about. But a lot of these things are often posited as, uh, you know, as alternatives when in fact they probably uh, are complementary. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And you addressed a lot of the uh, topics already we are going to discuss in the debate. So uh, let's introduce our fourth panelist and uh, start uh, debating. Thank you, Mark, for now. Our fourth uh, uh, panelist uh, is playing a home match tonight and uh, he is Jean-Pascal van Ypersele. Um, you're a professor of climate and environmental science at the University of uh, Leuven, Louvain, and uh, a former vice president of the IPCC. And m maybe you're even one of the, or, or maybe you're the best renowned climate scientist in Belgium, I would say. That's yeah. not for me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, okay, I would say. I say, welcome Jean-Pascal. Uh, to the this to de debate, you. yes, um, you are um, uh, you are the fourth uh, person to reflect on on all the answers that people uh, have been giving um, uh, as the solution. Uh, did you uh, did you hear strange things? No, well, it, it it was interesting, but it gave an impressionistic view of of the diversity of of views about the problem, as Ted highlighted. And actually, what uh, maybe we should bring to light in this debate is is the need. At least, I will defend that idea. Uh, for a systemic approach uh, where uh, multiple elements um, participate in a coherent way uh, to the solution, not only to the climate problem and or the climate crisis or emergency, call it the way you want, but also to many other uh, development uh, challenges that humanity has. I mean, it's a shame, for example, that almost a billion people don't have access to energy, many in Africa, by the way. Uh, it's a shame that many don't have access to clean water. It's a shame that, uh, you know, uh, one person of the uh, population of the world emits uh, as much greenhouse gas as uh, half of the population of the world. And uh, the same extreme inequality exists as well. Uh, in terms of uh, wealth. And uh, so there, there are a number of problems to address, not only climate change, and to address that range of, problem, uh, of problems, a systemic approach uh, is, is absolutely needed. Yeah. And this is, why, that, this is why I wear the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the logo, the pin uh, of the uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, you know, the I Agenda see. 30. Yeah. Because they put the, uh, the challenges we are facing, including uh, the climate change challenge, in, in the framework of uh, the, um, the 17 challenges that humanity needs to address. Yeah, uh, so actually climate change is one of these 17 challenges. That's right. Ah, okay. Thank you, uh, Jean-Pascal. We are going to uh, talk about um, 
policy makers and whether policy makers are um, underestimating the problem of climate change or are they already sufficiently aware of the severity of climate change or do they exaggerate the problem of climate change? So what do you think? Um, use the vote met button to press A, B or C. And uh, I'm curious um, about your opinion. What do you think? So, uh, well, I'd like to start with, uh, with Mark. Um, in your uh, book, Our Final Warning, you write, uh, when the Earth would warm six degrees, there could be human extinction and sterilization of the planet. Isn't that extremely uh, pessimistic? Um, no, I don't think that's pessimistic. I think that's in accordance with... Um well, certainly in accordance with the mass extinctions that we've seen in geological history, which were associated with temperature rises of that magnitude or more. Um, most of the great crises of life, you know, we're now in the sixth mass extinction due to biodiversity loss, but the previous five were um, associated with rapid climate change, mostly global heating as well. Um, there's been one or two indications of global cooling, but when there's been very dramatic increases in the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, that's been associated with um, die-offs of, of species and often quite severe die-offs and disappearances of coral reefs and all the kinds of things that we're beginning to see now. One of the things that jumped out at me when I was looking at the paleoclimate was that it seems pretty likely, pretty clear that the the the, the rapidity of the the scale of which we're taking carbon from the Earth's crust, so from fossil fuels, and putting it into the atmosphere in gaseous form is not matched anywhere in the geological record through any of the mass, you know, huge volcanic eruption episodes such as that, well, over pretty much since the, um, since the Cambrian explosion, so since the last 500,000 years. So we haven't seen anything which compares with the 21st century's rapidity and magnitude of global warming in the entire half billion years since complex life evolved, assuming that emissions continue to increase. So I don't think six degrees is, is, is pessimistic in any sense. I think that's what would happen if we, if we go along a worst case scenario emissions trajectory, plus the earth turns out to be very sensitive to greenhouse gases and we see intense feedbacks. Yep. But I don't, I don't think that's a likely outcome for the 21st century at all. And we're already beginning to see emissions reducing. We've got net zero targets covering much of the world economy now. So I think the chances of six degrees are much lower than they were even when I started writing the book. And I feel a lot more positive about that. But I still think it's important that we understand what the implications are of different emissions trajectories and different levels of warming. Yeah. And, and my next question is, of course, if policymakers are already convinced of this, well, severity of uh, climate change, what do you think? Um, well, you know, we've been talking about climate change. I've been talking about climate change, including to policymakers whenever I get the chance for, for you know, well on 20 years. I don't think it's news to anyone. Um, I think the challenge always is what to do about it and how to, how to, how to go about mitigation of, of, of carbon emissions in a way that doesn't lose you votes and, and doesn't uh, damage the economy. Um, I think we're now at a at kind of a critical tipping point, actually, where there is beginning to be momentum away from fossil fuels, which I think is, is, is probably unstoppable, and where the big, big economic incentives for future innovation are in the non-fossil area. So people, you know, are beginning to see opportunities to make very large amounts of money, the kind of Tesla-type experience across the whole economy now. And so I actually think the exit from fossil fuels could be more rapid than any of the scenarios that you know you see mapped out from the IEA and the big agencies uh, ever ever foresaw so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic but I think it's it's always important to, to emphasize the message that this is an emergency and that what's most important is that there are policies now not just to phase out fossil fuels but to essentially get but to get to net zero and to stop all future fossil fuel development in in developed countries um, let's see what the audience um, answered to that uh, question if they uh, wanted to answer uh, the question at all i uh, i saw in the uh, in my um, uh, corner of my eyes 
I saw the answers. And I think most people answered that policymakers underestimated um, the severity of climate change. And that's right. Uh, even 80% still under, uh, said they still underestimate the problem. And 14% um, said they are sufficiently aware and only three said they exaggerate the problem. So Jean Pascal, can I ask you, why do you think policymakers underestimate the urgency? If, well, you, if you agree on that as well. <laughs> well, in my view, they, they very much underestimate the urgency. You know, um, if, if they did not, uh, we would not be where we are now. Uh, we, where we have uh, a lot of um, uh, declaration of intentions, uh, but too little uh, real measures uh, taken up to now and leading to uh, strong, the strong, the very strong emission reductions which are needed, and and not only the emission reductions, but a more a comprehensive approach towards climate change, because the impacts of climate change are there already in many parts of the world, including in Europe, including in the US, and that means that. Adaptation policies are needed. It means also that uh, assistance and uh, funding from developed countries to developing countries, as recognized by the Paris Agreement, by the way, needs to be um, implemented as well. And that is not really taking place. I mean, there are many talks about that kind of things, but um, too little realizations. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not as optimistic as Mark about the, uh, the real commitment of policymakers. We're very able to talk. Yeah. Uh, but, but sometimes but, the other priorities take over, you know? And, and why, why do you think that policymakers still underestimate uh, the problem? Or maybe uh, they do not take action? Uh, it, it's not really my field of expertise, but I... I I uh, would like to hypothesize at least that um, uh, there is a certain disconnect with, with, with the reality. I mean, few policymakers uh, have a good understanding of science and, and the, the power of modeling, for example, to uh, project uh, the future and understand the, uh, uh, the possible evolution under different scenarios. Uh, few few policymakers uh, have been on the ground and seen um, uh, the the uh, the impact of climate change in different parts of the world, and um, you know uh, many are, are, are a little bit too receptive uh, to um, uh, the, the the power of um, economic lobbying groups who who, who simply want to uh, keep the status quo mm. <laughs> and, and keep keep um, as much uh, extraction uh, of fossil fuel as uh, Mark Linas was uh, described a minute ago yeah. uh, with a rate that, uh, that is way above what uh, happened in the past and, and that is totally unsustainable. So there's a lot of resistance, including among many policymakers, to really help to change uh, the, the way the economy works, for example, in the direction that's needed to respect not only the climate um, limits, but also limits in other parts of the um, of the environment. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Pascal. I, I'm curious if Paulina uh, agrees with you, because Pauline, you are working on the Sustainable Development Report 2023, uh, together with 14 scientists uh, selected by the United Nations. So, do you think that policymakers are making enough progress uh, to achieve the climate goals? Yeah. Thank you. Um I think uh, first <laughs> the question is who, what is a policymaker? I mean, a policymaker is a mom and dad like me and you. Uh, and, and the question is how much power do they have in the current uh, uh, kind of economic uh, situation where um, power is related to wealth? And, and, and the wealth they uh, uh, form about, we are told, 1% to 10% of the population. And we know from the social sciences that the wealthy, they, they, they don't go into politics, they, that's dirty, but they, they do what you call uh, rent paying. They have influence in how in the major policies of, of governments around the world. It doesn't matter whether you're a 
in the developing country or developed country. So uh, at the end of the day, you see the poor guy as the president there, and you think he's uh, the most powerful. But actually, there the are powerful groups, like um, Jen Pascal was saying, that are, are, are behind uh, what, what the direction of the major policy uh, that the country takes. But the, the other thing is uh, we have to separate these policymakers, policymakers in developed countries and in developing countries. Uh, sometimes in developing countries it's because uh, the issues are of immediate concern of, of life and death, of poverty, uh, you know, they, they come much higher than uh, the, the, the climate issue. For example, when the, the last elections in Botswana, there was hardly any discussion about uh, uh, the climate issue, although I can tell you <laughs> Southern Africa had the most severe drought in 2018 to 2019. Uh, in some countries like Namibia, the type that hasn't been witnessed in the past 70 years. Uh, so, but still, um, when it gets into uh, uh, campaigns uh, for, you know, in politics, uh, climate change was not uh, coming in as, a, as, a, as at the top of the agenda. But behind that is also that there is um, an ongoing, um, when a climate crisis or, a, a, or an extreme event occurs, it is never... Uh, immediately taken as climate change caused by humans. It's, it's called a natural disaster. So in that way, it's, it's hidden, uh, you know, it, it, it's hidden from, you know, what really is the cause. So it's called a natural disaster. And I always say there are no natural disasters. What we have is natural hazards. Disasters, all disasters are man-made. And people always say, oh, what do you mean by that? So that is really where we need to change the situation that all these disasters, it needs to be known uh, to the public and, and everyone that they are not natural. They are actually human cost. And, and that will increase uh, uh, the awareness. Exactly. But the last point I wanted to capture there is, is the way we, we, we bring in information about climate change to, to the world. I feel that continuously it comes as a top-down a, a kind of a, a channel. And, and that maybe gives the policymakers a lot of power to what they can do and what they can't do. Thank you, uh, Paulina. If I understood you right, um, the policymakers are not making enough um, progress to, to achieve the climate goals. And in, in developed countries, there are more important problems uh, uh, like hunger and poverty. There are more pressing issues. So, uh, therefore, yeah policymakers um, um, are aware but do not take yeah do not take action yet can I summarize it like that yeah Ted um, uh, I was curious uh, what you, what you heard just now are you as optimistic as uh, as mark or or a bit more uh, pessimistic uh, like Jean Pascal and Pauline? What do you think um, about policymakers? Well, well, we were promised a debate here, so I'm going to start one because um, we're not really having one so far. Um, so uh, I'll say a couple of things. The first is, um, you know, Mark and I agree um, on almost all of the solutions. Uh, I, I think we actually sort of disagree on, um, uh, well, it seems like disagree based on Mark's initial comments on the six degrees. Uh, but then actually Mark uh, acknowledges something that's really important, which is that six degrees of warming is extraordinarily improbable, um, that um, we are not remotely on any sort of emissions trajectory, worst case, business as usual, whatever label you want to put, it, put us on it, that gets us to six degrees. The only remotely plausible way we get to six degrees of warming, as Mark acknowledged later in his comments, is if the climate turns out to be extremely sensitive um, to greenhouse gas emissions at the very high end of estimates of how sensitive the climate might be. If that is the case, there's actually not very much we can do about the problem uh, because um, the warming, the amount of uh, emissions and, and, and emissions growth just sort of pretty much already built into the global energy economy means we'll have very, very high rates of warming even if we sort of stopped immediately. Um, so the first thing to say is that six degrees and the various sort of really catastrophic 
um, climate impacts associated with that is close to being uh, uh, improbable given everything that we understand right now about the trajectory of emissions, human population, economic growth, energy systems, all of it. Second point uh, is that, um, uh, you know, uh, as Mark also notes, and this I agree with, um, there's a lot of technological change happening already. Um, it is, I don't believe, consistent with stabilizing at 1.5 degrees, probably not even with two degrees, um, but I think, you know, when you really look at slowing, you know, rapidly ro slowing rates of population growth, um, the slowing of overall economic growth rates in uh, uh, industrialized economies everywhere in the world where, where rich economies today struggle to see even 2% annual growth on a consistent basis. When you look at the long-term shift of the sectoral makeup of the economy where we're moving from more carbon intensive to less carbon intensive economic activities that make up most of the sector. And then when you look at the growth of a more efficient, lower carbon technology, you put all those things together. I think the real choices and the things we really ought to be kind of talking about are are the choices we have, which is that, you know, if we're successful, we'll stabilize around the end of this century at something like two degrees of warming. And if we fail, we'll stabilize at something like three degrees of warming. There's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of actual, you know, what the sort of talk of six degrees versus 1.5 degrees obscures is the fact that, you know, there are big differences in terms of what the world looks like at three degrees versus two degrees. Um, and, 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 and I think that's the relevant conversation. Um, I think that the, the, the really the big impacts are actually for biodiversity, for ecosystems. Um, I think, uh, you know, human societies, uh, if they continue to see significant development, will do relatively well. Um, actually, we talk a lot about a climate emergency, um, but all of the evidence we have suggests that um, you know, mortality and impacts to human societies associated with climate change um, are uh, actually uh, have fallen significantly uh, over the last couple of decades. Um, uh, so, so, and, and so much so, in fact, that that you know, in the face of this climate emergency, um, people are voting with their feet, and 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 the way that they're voting actually is they're moving towards that. The, the climate hazard, not away from it. They're moving into coastal areas where most of our cities are. They're moving into floodplains. Um, and uh, over the long term, development can make us pretty resilient to the sorts of climate impacts that we worry about. Um, so for me, I worry a lot about uh, biodiversity. Uh, I, I would like us to get be closer to two degrees than three degrees. I think it'll be a, a, a better future for everybody to live in. Um, but I think these sort of catastrophic emergency framings that we put around the issue actually don't help. And to your original question, um, I think that uh, sort of policymakers, uh, whether they exaggerate or underestimate the risks and issues associated with climate change, are mostly doing that not due to sort of a lack of information, um, but are actually sort of responding often quite legitimately to a range of other concerns um, that uh, the populations and constituencies that they uh, represent uh, have. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising to me that policymakers are really, really, cons you know, after a pandemic that had huge economic impacts are focused on kind of uh, getting people back to work, um, rebuilding yeah. infrastructure, um, all of those things can be consistent with mitigating climate change, um, but we see what's actually driving the action here, uh, and it's not these sort of catastrophic uh, framings of climate change. So I understand. Um, yeah. There, now let's have a debate. Yeah. Okay, Ted. <laughs> so, um, uh, Jean Pascal, uh, you uh, you um, uh, know uh, activists like uh, Greta Thunberg, Youth for uh, Climate, and you you said. Uh, once that you were going to defend Greta Thunberg against the boomers and the old males. So 
please, uh, <laughs> can, can, can you uh, reflect on what Ted uh, just said about the, 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 well, the catastrophic um, uh, messages of, of activists? Well, you know, I, I agree with, with Ted that there's no need to, to, to exaggerate the situation. And uh, I agree also with the, the fact that the, uh, the, 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 the six degrees, at least um, by the end of this century, is, is, is not um, very likely. Now, it might take place later. After all, um, the effect of the accumulated greenhouse gases will be seen for much longer than the next uh, 80 years. But um, uh, I also agree with you, and I know he wanted to have a debate, so he might be disappointed, uh, with the fact that policymakers uh, answer to, to uh, the, the concerns of, of, their, of their voters. And, and this is uh, one of, of the many reasons uh, why the youth movement, inspired by Greta Thunberg originally, is, is so important, because it, it, it moved the perception of so many people in so many parts of the world, particularly in Europe, but not only in Europe. And um, if the um, European Union today has uh, its uh, net zero target by 2050, etc., it's in part um, because of the youth movement, which had a very significant influence before the European elections in May 2019. So, indeed, Greta Thunberg had um, a very important and, and positive role together uh, with, with uh, uh, colleagues in the youth movement uh, to uh, change the, the perception of, of many uh, citizens and policymakers uh, about the, um, the importance of, of tackling uh, this uh, emergency. So, um, how uh, can we uh, conclude this first part about uh, policy uh, makers, uh, dear panel? Um, should international and national policy makers uh, be motivated to do more about uh, climate change? Who thinks so? Mark thinks so. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, so. I work with the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is a group of 48 of the world's most climate vulnerable developing countries. Um, I, um, in that context, I'm advisor to President Nasheed, who's an ambassador for the Climate CVF, for the Climate Vulnerable Forum. Um, I should mention uh, that he, he was targeted in an assassination attempt with a bomb last Thursday. Um, so it's been the, he's been at the front and center of my thoughts and prayers since that time. He's been in intensive care surgery um, to have shrapnel removed, but it looks like he's going to be okay and have a long recovery. Fortunately. So, you know, th these kinds of events just come, come from nowhere. But at the same time, I know that he'll come back um, emboldened and, and want to redouble his efforts that he's had now for 10, 15 years, actually, to bring the plight of um, small island states onto the forefront of, of people's uh, awareness because... You know, the Climate Vulnerable Forum was instrumental in keeping the 1.5 degree target alive and making it part of the Paris Agreement in 2015. And they did that because many of the members, you know, they had this slogan, 1.5 to stay alive. And that's uh, an, an actual, <laughs> a real statement for countries like the Maldives, where even 1.5, the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees is potentially the difference between existence and non-existence if you take the sea level rise into account and the disappearance of the world's coral reefs. I think at okay. uh, 1.5 degrees, it's like 75% of the coral reefs go by two degrees, it's 99%. So we've essentially seen the extinction of, 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 an, of a large proportion of the marine biosphere, which is a, a, a you know, a, a cat catastrophe, I think, by anybody's measure. Um, and so, no, I don't think we should give up on 1.5. And, and the, the latest improvements in, in pledges made by world governments um, up, uh, actually, in, in advance of the Biden summit that was held a couple of weeks ago, um, if you look at the climate analytics latest analysis, that's improved our prospects to about 2.4 degrees by the end of the century. So no. 1.5 is, 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 we're not on a trajectory to 1.5, not even 2 degrees, but it's within reaching distance. Um, yes. And it, it would require very drastic cuts in emissions by the end of this decade 
to get to get on back on a two, on a 1.5 degree trajectory but i think it's still something we have to we have to aim for and have to aim for very strongly exactly yes so um what you said is is um, we are heading. Ted said we are heading towards uh, two or three degrees. But you say we have to work harder and aim for for 1.5. And I see Jean Pascal also uh, yes. uh, well, nodding. Yeah. Well, I think it might be optimistic because you know some. I disagree with some of those projections. Actually, uh, I think <laughs> they make very optimistic hypotheses with uh, the um, the um, extension of the um, commitments that have been announced. You know, most announced now, most announcement now in terms of measures are made until 2030. But what yeah. happens between 2030 and 2080 is extremely important for the, uh, the warming in 2100. And the hypothesis made in many of those projections are very optimistic. You know that the trends, the decreasing trend would continue uh, the way they have done uh, recently, at a, at a time where low-hanging fruits were um, captured, it won't be so easy uh, to continue uh, to uh, decrease the emissions uh, the way some countries have done recently, if not much more um, political commitment to do more yes. is not present. So, you know, I would be a little bit cautious uh, about... Uh, considering uh, the uh, the talks, uh, including at the recent uh, U.S. summit, as sufficient uh, to stay even under two degrees, uh, three degrees. Okay, you you are you are cautious to what to what degree uh, the the climate will uh, rise, but we all agree, I think, that we have to work a bit harder. Much uh, harder. Yeah, much yeah. harder. Um, yeah, I would I would add there. If, if yes, possible, Paulina. That yeah, as, as we speak about this, um, you know, we are speaking about global averages. We should realize that um, warming won't be, you know, equal ac ac across the regions. I mean, already in the past True. century, the, the dry areas have warmed 20 to 40 percent higher than the humid areas. And, and these regions, uh, the, the emissions from them is less than 30 percent from the humid regions. And when you get to 1.5 you know, global average, Maybe our regions will be talking into warming at around three degrees. Exactly. So the risks will be very high in some regions than in others. So we need to look True. at this. Uh, yes. Know, we, it's we, not equal. we generalize uh, a bit for the yeah. whole uh, world, but it's different in different regions. You are completely right uh, about that, uh, Paulina. Uh, we have to uh, we have to uh, um, close this because uh, time is uh, running fast, and we go immediately to our uh, second topic. And after that, we are asking questions from the audience. And the second topic is about economic uh, development. So, how should we reconcile climate action with economic development and the fight against poverty? Um, what we were talking about in the introduction, uh, Jean-Pascal mentioned it as well. Um, some believe that economic growth is still the way forward and others believe the time has come for degrowth. So what do you uh, think uh, at home? Is there still room for economic growth in rich and industrialized countries in this age of climate change? Uh, please press the vote button below and say... Uh, if we need economic growth or whether it's time for degrowth or maybe you don't know the answer and then you can press C. I'm curious, Ted, um, what does it mean when we talk about uh, uh, growth versus degrowth? Uh, does, growth in, does it mean growth in GDP or growth in the use of materials as, as well? Or should, are, they, are there two different things? Can you explain a bit yeah, about that? I mean, I think that um, uh, there is a, you know, when we talk about economic growth, um, you know, we are talking, uh, you know, sort of typically about um, the growth of sort of basically per capita income toward, you know, times the size of the, popula size of the population. So, um, you know, a lot of like what we observe when we look at sort of gross global or national economic growth historically has actually mostly just been population growth. Um, uh, those oh. economies would have grown even if per capita incomes didn't rise. Um, uh, then we've also seen all around the world lots and lots of, of income growth. Um, 
And, and, and so, you know, first of all, we kind of, when we say this sort of economic growth, we're talking about both of these things uh, kind of essentially multiplied together. Um, and they're actually not the same thing. Um, now, a, a second factor when we're talking about sort of growth versus degrowth or economic growth trajectories over the course of this century is what's happening demographically. Um, so, you know, um, you know, uh, most of Europe right now is in a, undergoing a process of a very slow population collapse, um, as is Japan. Uh, we're seeing, you know, significant population growth uh, still in some parts of the world, um, um, mostly uh, sort of uh, less wealthy areas. Um, but even in those areas, mostly uh, fertility rates are falling um, as people mm -hmm. move from very poor rural agrarian uh, economic contexts to uh, urban contexts um, and move into the formal economy and and industrialized to varying degrees and service economies. And so there's a bunch of reasons why population or fertility rates fall. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, we're, uh, um, you know, then there's a the question of what is the relationship between these things and economic, I, I mean, and environmental impacts. Um, exactly. And, um, you know, and the answer is it depends. Um, uh, it depends on the impact um, and it, it um, uh, depends on the context. So, um, you know, in lots of places, um, we are now seeing continuing uh, economic growth with falling greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we can see this sort of decoupling uh, in uh, across all sorts of other um, environmental impacts, things like land use or water withdrawals or things like that. Um, that's a, a salutary uh, uh, process and, and development. Um, uh, I think we can continue to see uh, long-term, albeit, prob albeit probably slowing rates of economic growth um, uh, globally, uh, even as uh, we see falling environmental uh, impacts. That's dependent on technological change. That's dependent on how economies change over time. But I think one point that is missed in these debates is the degree to which having growth and economic surplus is really critical to continuing the sort of technological change that it's going to take to deal with climate change. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about uh, sort of rebuilding the entire global infrastructure to not emit carbon. Um, uh, that actually takes a lot of wealth to do. Um, okay. And it's easier to do in the context of a growing economy uh, than a shrinking economy. Economies that are in the process of, of seeing very low or falling economic growth have a really, really hard time building any sort of new infrastructure at all. And fundamentally, if you're talking about deeply decarbonizing a global economy, you have to build new infrastructure, a new low carbon exactly. global infrastructure everywhere in the world. It's really, really hard to do that if you don't have some ongoing economic growth. Jean-Pascal, um we were talking about uh, Greta Thunberg uh, uh, at our former um, subject, and uh, you ally yourself with climate activists, I said, and, and Greta Thunberg said in her famous speech, uh, she was talking about the fairy tales of eternal economic growth. Um, so I guess you think it's time for degrowth or not? Well, uh, you know, Let's go back a little bit to your question, because it really depends uh, what is growing. I mean, I, I agree that some activities need to grow, you know, uh, improving in a very significant way the energy, the energy efficiency of buildings uh, everywhere, mm -hmm. not only in <laughs> developed countries, but also in, in developing countries uh, where a lot of energy is wasted for air conditioning, for example, because the buildings have not been designed uh, to allow for for for, for comfortable mm -hmm. living uh, in in a warming climate, so that kind of activities need to grow. Agreed, but okay. on the other hand, uh, what needs to degrow uh, is everything that's related to fossil fuels. I mean, uh, extracting coal, uh, oil, and gas, and uh, promoting uh, its usage needs 
um, uh, obviously to degrow if we want to de decrease the uh, CO2 emissions and uh, methane emissions, etc. So, okay. you know, it, we, I think we need to have a, a nuanced approach. Some activities need to grow, some others need to degrow. Okay. And, and with, with uh, the objective of, of protecting uh, climate while at the same time making a better life for everybody on this planet. But what does that say about the whole economy as a total? Do, well, what, means, what would you say to the question? Well, uh, it, mean, it means that the economy needs to be, uh, in many parts of the world, reoriented so that, uh, you know, the impacts of the, the, the many present economic activities are taken into account uh, through the polluter pays principle, which is too little uh, applied um, up to now. You know, if, if um, the um, different economic actors, uh, big and small, including citizens uh, and multinationals, were all paying the real costs of the uh, impact of their activities in different areas, uh, things would change in a significant manner. Uh, because the long-term impacts of fossil fuel yeah. usage uh, is very negative for the environment, for example. Uh, yeah, I understand what you mean. I'm curious what, uh, if, if Pauline would agree with, uh, with Jean Pascal or maybe more with uh, Ted, who likes uh, uh, growth of the economy. Would you like um, that as well, Pauline? With whom do you agree most? I. I think if you look at the uh, the climate convention itself, it already talks about the the need for sustainable, you know, development in a sustainable manner. So uh, the the convention really didn't say uh, we we have to stop uh, economic growth, but it talks about sustainability. Now the question is, what is sustainability? Is sustainability only about emissions? Or mm -hmm. does it also include whether everybody, uh, that prosperity, that growth, whether it's reoriented or whatever the case, does it also cover everyone? Because the type of economic growth we had now is the type where prosperity in one region means doom in another one. So that's the reorientation really needs to be brought to make sure that uh, uh, um, the wealth, the global wealth uh, uh, supports Yes. You know, all the different people around the world. Yes. In, in, my, in my view is that uh, one of the things as we, I said earlier on that you, you, there is a great wealth that is held by a few. And so really in an ideal world, we should be looking and saying, given the wealth that we already have, you know, can't we deploy it, you know, uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, address this uh, new need for a new direction, new infrastructure and everything, without even going into economic growth. If we pro make a projection that we can have a six degrees, let's say, just you no know, 6% yeah, economic growth, but decide that instead of going 6%, we're going to go three, because we, we can utilize the wealth that is already there. And you can visualize this in Joe Biden's uh, recent decision. On, on trying to uh, assist the middle income uh, uh, people. He didn't, he's saying, I'm going to use the wealth that is there in America exactly. and make sure that it goes into this, into this uh, uh, large population of Americans that looks like inequality has become such a big issue in that country. Yeah. But I like the fact that he's not going to create, uh, look for money elsewhere. He's using the one that is there, using Texas to, to exactly. draw into that wealth. So, so actually, the question is, couldn't we draw into the world that we already have to exactly. address this new reorientation rather so, than be thinking of the, uh, putting more resources to create this you know, new change, yeah. transition that we need? It doesn't even mean that you can take all the wealth from the rich people. It, it could be just a percentage of about 30, 40 percent of, of the global wealth that we have accumulated over the years by going out in different regions uh, 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 raw materials in the cheapest way we can and at the same time creating a lot of poverty in those regions which means you have reduced the adaptation capacity of that region. The climate change is not only about reducing emissions, it's also about adaptation. Yeah. So these two arms need to go together in this, in this discussion. We shouldn't only think about reducing the emissions and temperatures but what about yeah. the adaptation? Which is the problem in adaptation is that we have got a lot of a huge number of people who are poor, primarily because other regions 
have set out a certain economic uh, uh, order that, that goes in that direction. In my view, uh, um, if, if you're going to get diamonds from Botswana, which is what has been happening, Exactly. What if these yeah. diamonds hit Europe and their value increases? Yeah. A certain percentage must go back to the origin where you got the raw material. Every exactly. time you get, whether it's a medicinal plant you got or is it food plant, and, and you develop it into something else elsewhere, which means this value increases, a certain percentage must go back where it, it came from. So you, you are not creating poverty in the other area, taking things away, which, exactly. is, which is the trend. That exactly. is the kind of economic growth that will be interesting. Yeah. We no, not the one where uh, we continue uh, having others, yeah. you know, uh, losing out. You know, and how do, we, how do we address the issue of vulnerability to, to effect uh, sustainability? Exactly. We should, we should of, look uh, at it regions. Yeah. broader. Uh, uh, so climate change is, should uh, go hand in hand with, with other sustainable development uh, goals, like uh, Jean-Pascal said. Uh, I would um, uh, like to uh, look at what the audience said. Is there still room for economic growth in rich and industrialized countries? Uh, and 24% uh, said, yes, we still need... Um, economic growth and 36% uh, says it's time for degrowth and 21% says um, I don't know. So uh, that's um, a divided audience. Mark Linens, are you surprised when you see the audience answering uh, so divided? They no. also don't know? No, because it's a very dif difficult question. Um, and I, I don't think you can take the perspective of just asking whether growth in industrialized countries should continue or not continue, because the whole global economy is, is completely interlinked. I mean, if you look at the 2008 financial crash, um, that, where did that began in, in the United States with subprime mortgages and then ricocheted around the world and led to a, a global recession, which occurred to different extents in different places. But once you have a, an economy which is as connected um, and interdependent as the one we have, it's not really a meaningful question. And I think the most important thing to understand is that growth is non-negotiable in developing countries. So I yeah. mentioned earlier on work that I work with the Climate Vulnerable Forum. The chair of that is held by Bangladesh at the moment, and the Prime Minister of Bangladesh um, made a, a statement at the UN General Assembly launching what, they, what she's called a climate prosperity plan, where essentially Bangladesh aims to be a middle-income country by 2041. They don't, they're already graduating from LDC, from least developed country status, uh, and they want to continue moving on up the scale away from, uh, away from mass poverty, as they were in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so the question then is, given that this growth is essential and non-negotiable, how do we deliver that at the same time as moving towards uh, net zero? So what, exactly. are, the, what yeah. are the infrastructure investments you need? And you can actually work that out. It's, and if you average it out across all of these developing countries, it's trillions of dollars of clean energy investments need to be made and need to be made um, very quickly. And that includes, that means, you know, fairly pragmatic things like reducing the cost of capital, making sure that there's, um, uh, that, that, that there's guarantee, export credit guarantees, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, it's the kind of stuff that governments uh, should be good at doing. And I don't think that uh, the, the, the degrowth agenda has much to offer there because we've still got the problem of, of, of large scale poverty amongst the majority of the world's population. Yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, it's it's the wrong question. You say growth or uh, or degrowth. Um, uh, de developing countries should also um, uh, make a green uh, leap. So how do we do that? We have a question uh, from. Um, uh, Anuna de Wever on this topic, and she is a Belgian climate activist and was one of the leading figures in the school st strike for the climate movement in Belgium. Uh, so, Anuna, what is your question? When we activists talk about climate change, we talk about a system change. We talk about redesigning our economic system, reprioritizing human rights, and respecting our planetary boundaries. It is fair to say that we, as rich, privileged countries are not facing the direct consequences of climate change as urgent as other countries in the global south. Does that mean that we also have a way bigger responsibility into tackling and funding the fight against climate change right now? 
Yes, so who can answer this uh, question? Western countries have a large, large uh, responsibility. Sh should they do more? Of who, uh, yes, <laughs> Jean Pascal? Yeah. Of course, they need, I mean, this is recognized. It's a basic principle of the, um, of the uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, th there is a common responsibility for climate because it's the total of emissions coming from everybody uh, which matters. Uh, the, uh, one ton uh, of CO2 emitted in Botswana uh, has the same effect on climate as a ton of CO2 emitted in New York in Brussels, but... Uh, people in New York and Brussels emit much more uh, tons, uh, many more tons of CO2 uh, than the people of Botswana. And so there's uh, not only a common responsibility, but a differentiated responsibility, particularly if you look at, uh, at uh, the historical responsibility. CO2 stays very long in the atmosphere. You know, between uh, 15 and 40 percent of one ton of CO2 we emit today Will, st will still be present in the atmosphere in 1,000 years from now. So it's clear that uh, developed countries, uh, which have emitted uh, a lot in the past and up to now, yeah. have a, a much larger responsibility to, to address the issue. Yeah. Yes, to me thank, that's obvious. Thank you, uh, Jean-Pascal. Jean I'm, I'm curious whether Ted also agrees uh, with that. Should rich countries help developing countries to develop a green uh, electricity grid, Ted? I mean, yes, although, I, you know, I think there are sort of some premises in these discussions that are worthy of, of taking a harder look at. So, um, you know, first of all, there's this idea that sort of, you know, um, your, the questioner, you know, sort of articulated this quite well. We're, some we, some global we is going to sort of redesign the global economic system and, and uh, you know, redistribute wealth from one place to another well, first of all, this we does not exist. There's no, um, you know, the, the UN ostensibly kind of claims this, this role, but, but it, it, it's never been able to play it. There's no, you know, uh, nations maintain their sovereignty, um, uh, whether climate activists or anyone else likes, likes that or not. Um, uh, secondly, you know, there's this kind of, you know, uh, Pauline articulated it well, right? You know, we'll need to take 30 or 40 percent of the global wealth from the rich countries and sort of spread it around. So we don't need as much growth to to meet these development objectives. And first of all, from the perspective of a poor country, you know, given um, all that, uh, you know, sort of rich uh, colonial powers over hundreds of years have have already imposed on them. I think it's understandable that in a lot of places, um, self sort of self determination uh, and 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 actually kind of growing your economy uh, on your own terms uh, is an important thing to do. I mean, I if I was in uh, you know Botswana or any other poor country around the world, I'm not sure um, that I would feel particularly. Um, confident, uh, even if rich developed countries were like, okay, now we're going to support you and we're going to redistribute our wealth to you so that you don't have to go through the same economic processes that, 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 that we did and, and, and we can save the planet. And it's kind of like, well, what happens when you change your mind? Why, 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 you know, why would I, um, uh, you know, why would I remotely take your word, uh, for this, um, so, so I sort of feel like there's a lot of um, kind of uh, um, underneath the idealism, I, the, the idealism, I think there's kind of um, uh, a bunch of reasons why I think those in developing countries ought to be sort of suspicious of, um, uh, uh, you know, Europeans and Americans bearing gifts. Um, and if you look at, you know, say, for instance, China, um, you know, China's happy to sort of uh, take technology where they can find it. But the Chinese are really clear that, you know, um, they are going to uh, uh, develop on their own terms. Um, uh, this idea that we're going to sort of beneficently hand our technology to them, uh, you know, is as likely to, to go operate in the other direction where it's actually the Chinese that are going to do a lot of the uh, technological development and deployment, and we're going to buy it from them. Um, so I think there are a whole set of assumptions that go back to like the 70s, 80s, when the whole climate convention and the UN framework for this was created that I think are, are worth uh, questioning in terms of whether this is actually 
to the degree to which the world deals with any of these problems, this is how it's go- the world is going to deal with them. Pauline, uh, do you agree with what he said? With, the, with what Ted said, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure he's agreeing or um, reflecting on on, on 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 the question that came from you know the the, the person from who Anuna the yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, it, yeah that uh, um, should the developed world do more. I mean, that has been the way much of the climate negoti- negotiations are, are operating at that level. You know, uh, that the developed world needs to do more, in, uh, put more into adaptation. But as I told you, I think the developed world have a, a task of changing the approach uh, of, of the whole development framework. That's where it needs to be done. I mean, right now, uh, just a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, um, certain NGOs from developed world approach me uh, concerned that there is a exploration of, of, of I think it's gas and oil in the Okavango Delta. I mean, it's a very prime area that we are very proud of, but none of us being Botswana would like to see that. And I was thinking they are from, coming from abroad. They should have been uh, going to their governments uh, where these companies are linked to, to, to take that matter to them. That Why are you going that direction? Because what they do, they come into the countries, they do what you, what you call it, uh, 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 you know, where you buy in, you know, so, you know, uh, uh, support from the communities. You, you select the most powerful part of the community, you buy your support, and you, you, you extract the, 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 the products that you need. You pay very little to the little uh, labor that is around in the villages. And from there, the country that is actually offering these raw materials, you also provide very small amount in terms of proportion of wealth that you are going to create. And that has been the case since industrialization. Yes. Yeah, so that, that is the we direction should, you, we should change this that. This is what you need, to, you need to address that. Yes. And not only that, uh, uh, before you, uh, you come in, not only that, when you don't get uh, uh, the channel to extract these uh, uh, raw materials that you do, you, you actually cause conflicts. You know, the question is, what, what, why is Libya the way it is? What, what is happening in the Arab world? Is it really just what is happening? It's all economy. It's because we need certain raw, <laughs> raw materials. And we create this destabilization. And there's no way you can have climate change, address climate change, when the governments have collapsed. You know, that is one, one of the things. And it's not only that. That global security is engulfing almost the whole world now. You know, the, the, the religious extremists that you see. They are not delinked. They are very linked to, the, to this whole so, development pathway that we follow. And that is what the, 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 the most wealth countries have to sit down and say, this uh, pattern or this path of development that we, are, that we are following, is it really sustainable? And that includes trade in arms, you know, just uh, arms of war. They make three, 300 billions, <laughs> you know. You, yeah. you can't uh, uh, do that. The reason why you're doing that is first. You must now create a market for it, which means you must go and destabilize so that people can buy these arms. I and understand, that really, Paulina. That, yes. that, that is where the issue is. It yes, is we should... We the should, path of development that you select. We it's should stop extracting raw materials. Come into my country and giving me money to say, okay, we're going to give you this... Uh, you know, we heard that uh, from the negotiations, you're supposed to give us some money for adaptation. Exactly. We should stop it, extracting raw enough. materials and paying uh, developed countries uh, uh, so uh, not enough for it. Uh, uh, we are going to talk about um, uh, how, how developing countries can make a, a green leap. And that brings us to our third um, uh, topic. Um, what helps most to bring our emissions down to zero? Do we already have all technological solutions or do we need to innovate? Uh, should we change our lifestyle or can we have a future of 8 billion people flying all over the world? Uh, I have one more poll question um, uh, for you and that is, um, we need a lot of different things to tackle climate change, but out of the following three, which uh, will be the most important? Will it A, be technological innovations, B, lifestyle changes like flying less, eating less meat, recycling, 
Government policies is answer C, like uh, carbon, carbon tax or subsidies, or answer D, I don't know. Let's have a look at the answers of the poll question. We need a lot of different things to tackle climate change. And out of the following three, which thinks the audience is the most important? Well, the audience thinks 35% thinks that technological innovation is most uh, important. And I think um, uh, Ted is not at all surprised by that. Um, I think you would agree. Um, what kind of technological uh, innovations do we need, Ted? Uh, a lot. <laughs> I mean, we talk a lot about, um, you know, solar and wind. Uh, you know, there's a there's a saying in the U.S. I don't know if you have it uh, in Belgium um, that uh, it says, uh, you know, um, why does uh, you know why does the drunk look for his keys under the lamppost because that's where the light is. Um, so we spend a lot of time arguing about um, you know things like wind and solar versus nuclear energy uh, because they're all things that we uh, uh, use to decarbonize uh, electrical grids, um, which is like sort of the one thing it's as, as uh, um, uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, as Pascal mentioned earlier, uh, it's the low hanging fruit. Um, and we don't talk about all the things that are much, much harder to decarbonize. Um, uh, you, you can't, it's very difficult to make steel only with electricity mm -hmm. or cement uh, or um, to uh, fly a plane uh, with electricity um, or to make uh, synthetic fertilizer, which many parts of the world need to raise agricultural yields and produce more food. Um, so um, uh, those, are, uh, those are all areas where there's just huge need for innovation. We're not getting anywhere close to zero or net zero without them. And we really mostly don't know how to do those things right now. Uh, Jean Pascal, um, you said we um, uh, we don't need any innovations. We could we could if we only could all use the existing technological innovations. You said. Um, well, I, I don't think I ever said we don't need innovation. <laughs> I, I said, on the other hand, that uh, with the knowledge we have and the technologies we have, much more could be done by implementing them many of them on a very large scale, and that's not done. I mean, just look at the, the very simple technology and knowledge about uh, insulating buildings and energy efficiency in buildings, and, and, and still, that is well known, and still, most buildings in the world have a very low efficiency. But I'm very, yeah. very much in favor of uh, innovation and research, etc. But I, I okay. also... Okay, Let's but in let a me way what we know. Let me rephrase it. You are you. you we should more implement more of the uh, already existing technologies. Um, but when you would answer this poll question, would you choose technological innovations or or lifestyle changes or government policies? Well, the three the three are needed. I mean, they go together. You know, government policies are needed to. Um, but uh, that's to not one of the answer categories. Unfortunately, yeah, well, <laughs> I, I hope it's still my freedom to disagree okay, with, okay. with the, being put in, in, in <laughs> silo. I think as I, as I started, we need a, um, a, a system approach and a combination of different approaches. You're right. So we need government policies. We need technology, old and new. And yeah. we need uh, changes in individual behavior. We need all of that. We need all of them. Okay. Um, uh, let me go on on the, uh, the lifestyle changes because I, I think it's good to say something about uh, that. I didn't hear a lot about that. Um, uh, I, I come again to you, uh, Jean Pascal, because you said something about we need to change our moral attitude about meat or, or flying, just as we did on smoking. Um, can you explain it a bit more? Well, it's not the moral attitude, it's the, the, the cultural attitude. Cultural. Attitude, you know, yeah. You know, 20 years ago, it was considered normal in the ambient culture in, in many countries to smoke in, in public spaces, even in, in closed spaces and even in, in, in planes and trains. Exactly. And, 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 and now, now uh, the, the, the culture about that kind of behavior has officially 
sufficiently changed in many countries in the world so that what was considered normal 20 years or 30 years ago is not normal at all. And I, I think that progressively uh, the same thing might happen uh, for, uh, you know, burning fossil fuel, for example. For example, or, uh, yes. And, or and, eating and meat. That, and that would really help. Such yes. a cultural change would really help. What do we need to change the culture? Yeah, yeah. It's again, it's a range of of, uh, of tools and measures. Education is extremely important, and uh, you know the drawdown project, for example, identified the the education of of girls uh, as a key element mm -hmm. uh, to make progress on on long term emission reductions. That's one of the but, SDGs but, as well. Uh, but but changes yeah. in the uh, the way the advertisement is made uh, is uh, would be welcome as well. It doesn't need. Uh, it doesn't mean forbidding any advertisement, but uh, some changes in the advertising industry would be welcome as well. <laughs> True, that was one of the comments. Uh, we also need uh, w governments to, to, to act. So what should, uh, what should they um, do? Um, sh do? Do we need a long-term strategy? Do, do we need more investments in innovation? Um, do we need other politicians to become leaders again? Do we need carbon taxes? What, what should governments do in the first place? Mark, you are you have experience with advising governments. What? Yeah, I think I think any suggestion that you know we've we've just had a year long experiment on what it looks like to stop flying. Um, everyone's desperate to get back on their plane as soon as the lockdowns are lifted. Um, it's, it's simply not the idea that we could somehow maintain that forever. It's just it's fantasy land and it's a, not a very nice fantasy either. So obviously we're going to have to have a technological innovation which takes us to zero carbon aviation. Um, I, my money would be on ammonia as um, the best carrier for hydrogen. Um, and I think actually if you look at the, some of the more recent engineering and the, the kind of physics of this, it could actually we, we could actually have aviation being one of the most sustainable um, and e efficient ways of travel. So the idea that planes are always bad is just uh, old-fashioned thinking, and we need to we need to get beyond that. It's a bit so this idea wow. that how, how long will it take that we would, that uh, we will be flying sustainably all over the world? I think it needs to be driven by policy. So okay. we need to have a, a phase-out date. I mean, in the UK, we've got a phase-out date now for for the internal combustion engine. There will be no more petrol or diesel vehicles sold after 2030. That's eight years from now. That means we need to have all of the charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. Et cetera, et cetera, all in place by then. So you need the policy to direct the, the pace of the transition, and then that will then open up business or, business opportunities for innovation. And the policy then to go one step back from that is driven by the school strikers and driven by people out in the streets and, and people making these demands. So this okay. doesn't come from nowhere, and technological innovation doesn't just happen by itself. It has to be driven by the demands from the pu pu public outlaw, uh, uh, you know, that we have to solve this climate emergency. Okay, so more climate uh, strikes, um, please. Sha, is, is that a message to our audience? And, <laughs> Pauline and, and is laughing. Listening to them. <laughs> Sorry, for Jean Pascal, what did you say? And, and, and policymakers listening better to them. Uh, listening uh, better to climate uh, strikers. And Pauline, why are you laughing? More about no, it's a, it's also I'm thinking that you, when you started, you said there were only six percent of among the people who are attending, only six percent were only were policymakers, isn't it? Something like that. So already we have a few a few of them here. I'm laughing at the more strikes, uh, and uh, I think earlier on I, I spoke about engaging the public more into uh, this uh, policy uh, oriented report, so that the members of the public somehow have an input. In these documents before they go back into the into the government, and I think it's part of that. But if you talk about technology, I think we should also consider indigenous technologies because sometimes what what happens is that we we have selected certain technologies and we promote them so hard and we make it difficult for other uh, technologies to which could be uh, efficient uh, in, in other regions, uh, you know, uh, may, maybe used more sustainably. I, I, equally with agriculture, I mean, he was talking about. Um, uh, what you call it, synthetic uh, fertilizers. But, you know, uh, right now we, we produce so much food, we have got enough food for everyone, but people are hungry. So this kind of agriculture practices and the technologies that we are advancing for, is not helping us in terms of sustainability. Maybe we should think of a different Sorry. agriculture system. Can it be a bit yeah, We need a different... Uh, 
Hello, hello. Yes. Are we losing you again? Yeah, no. Uh, you were talking about <laughs> fertilizer and, and, and food. You said we have enough f uh, food. We don't need fertilizer. Uh, did I? Yeah, we, we produce enough food, but still people are hungry. So it is not a question of uh, the amount of food we produce. It's, it's, we go back to the issue of distribution. But also the type of agriculture we practice is so destructive to the environment. And, and now uh, it, it, there are people who are looking at innovative ways of producing food. They talk about regenerative uh, agriculture rather than extractive agriculture. And yeah. that, that kind of agriculture will not require the, that kind of fertilizer we are talking about. So okay. like, and, and Pascal was saying we need to reorient, you know, reorientation of, of, of the way we, we do things. Okay, that's a, that's a good remark. I'm, I'm going to have to go. I'm just going to say one thing. About 60% yes, of yeah. humans alive today could not be alive today without synthetic fertilizer. I will leave you on that. Thank you. I got to go. <laughs> Hooray for synthetic fertilizer, says Ted. Uh, Mark, do you want to add something? No, I was just waving goodbye to Ted. I mean, uh, <laughs> oh. the, the thing is, uh, I mean, the thing is the truth. I mean, it, it, I think that's what Mill made that original calculation. Uh -huh. that the proportion of, of nitrogen going into a human food supply, which is is synthesized through the Haber-Bosch process. So it doesn't, you know, in pre-industrial agriculture, food shortages were, were 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 extreme across the whole of the globe. So yes, we have on, on aggregate sufficient food, but the, the fact is that, um, yeah. that, that subsistence farmers, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where you're talking from, Paulina, have, have much, much, much lower yields. Um, and this yield gap is something that needs addressing in, in a most sustainable way that... Uh, addresses these these issues um i i looks to have frozen again here so i'm going to stop yes. talking <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we need to address the uh, the yield gap in a sustainable way, and whether is uh, whether that is with uh, synthetic fertilizers or not, uh, we are we are leaving that uh, for in the middle for now because of the time. I really um, uh, would like to conclude this uh, this this the part of the debate by by saying that we need technological innovations as well as lifestyle changes and government policies, just as we discussed. So let's move on um, to, um, to the questions of the audience. Um, Kathleen Bolte's question was um, most um, favored. Um, uh, she got 16 thumbs and she says, why is climate change not getting the same media campaigns to drive behavior change as COVID does? Hmm. <laughs> Well, Jean Pascal, yeah, you know, yes. Uh, yeah, I, well, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that question. I mean, just an Yours? element of answer okay. is, is, is again short term versus long term. I mean, with COVID, we see immediately the, uh, the, 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 the effect. Uh, we know people who have been affected, who have died, etc. For climate, uh, for, for many people, it's more abstract and it's uh, happening in the future. And uh, that's, uh, that's a difficulty. So that's yeah. maybe, uh, maybe one reason. That's climate uh, psychology, that it's, uh, uh, it's not, it, it, is it not a crisis yeah. enough or? Yeah, and, and still, um, uh, in, in, in the medium to long term, the consequences of climate change will be much more severe, yes. even if we stay below two degrees. <laughs> exactly, but it's uh, that, difficult that, for that people. That's the consequence of COVID. Yes. And, and look at air pollution also. I mean, air pollution kills as much in one year uh, as um, every year as COVID has killed since the beginning of the pandemics. I mean, so, you know, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the perception uh, of Risk many perception. people, about the, the, the misperception about the urgency of, of tackling climate change, air pollution, and actually other environmental problems as well, uh, is, is, is really big. Mark, um, is there another reason maybe that, that uh, climate change is not getting the same media campaigns? Um, I'll go back to the point. I don't think behavior change on its own is going to get you anywhere. It's like, um, I, I, I mean, there's some exceptions to this. I actually would like to see um, us move towards net zero on meat consumption, or at least meat from livestock. Um, and, you know, but then there's been vegans around since forever, and the whole world hasn't turned vegan. So what we need is meat substitutes. We need, uh, you know, protein, alternative protein substitutes, which can be 
um, uh, at lower cost and can be more delicious and, and etc. Than, than than meat from livestock. Um, and you can make ethical arguments that, that support that as well. And cl- we can't solve the climate change problem unless we unless we address address livestock and meat consumption as well. So it's a, so, you know the, these lifestyle changes go in parallel with technological innovation, which then allows them to take place. So you know you've got for meat you've got the Impossible Burger, which tastes just like real meat because it's got you know genetically engineered proteins in it and stuff. Um, that that then means that people are not eating that beef, and that then is better for the climate. But you know, would that would that have happened by itself? Probably not. So we can now envisage, I think, drastically reducing global meat production and consumption, and releasing that land, which would otherwise have been used for livestock, to for rewilding and carbon sequestration, bringing the forests back, natural climate solutions, these kinds of things. Um, but you've got to have the technology, which then enables the lifestyle changes to be sustainable if you like but just just a small remark on meat consumption and and the ipcc has written many times then that recently that uh, a shift from from um, meat consumption to a more plant diet oriented um, regime mm-hmm. would benefit climate uh, i'm not sure it's it only needs um, technology um, because you know the uh Uh, many parts of the world uh, have a plant-based um, uh, uh, diet and and are in in, in good health uh, with, with that. I mean, the, you just have to know which kind of uh, amino acids you have to to mix uh, from uh, cereals and uh, leguminous, etc. And if you do that, um, you you can have a very healthy diet uh, with very little meat. Yeah. Um, so so. Technology might help one day, but uh, again, uh, with the knowledge we have today, there is a way to have a more plant uh, diet, a plant-oriented diet, and a good health, and and less impact on climate. It's available today, and actually, many people are making that choice. Uh, should behavior change uh, with help of uh, media campaigns, or is behavior changed by uh, technological innovations? Pauline, your Your opinion on this? Uh, behavior change. I, I think uh, maybe we need to contextualize it. We're talking about meat, but we forget about drama. You know, you know that decision that you, you one person has got two wardrobes full of clothes and they're changing <laughs> several shoes that you buy and you wear two, three times, and you go to the shop and you're buying again and again, and, and it goes also to the house and the furniture and everything. So uh, the issue is what drives that uh, uh, is consumerism. Consumerism, yes. Yeah. What drives it? It's because that consumerism is profit driven. There, there's some industry that benefits from that. Yeah. So uh, they they campaign and they 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 actually don't. They work very hard on that to make sure that your psychology is tuned to this uh, product and service. Yeah. And eventually, you make it part of your culture. And it becomes like it's impossible. I can't live without it, you know that kind of thing. So we 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 need like I was saying earlier on that we need to to look at the way we do business. Uh, how do we grow our economy? Because that's where we are actually trying to grow our economy. If you go now to the African countries on the market, you will find heaps and heaps of old yeah. clothes <laughs> that are coming from your direction. But how do we change <laughs> consumerism? <laughs> You know, yeah, that is the consumer. There, some of them are selling under trees. They are being hanged because people are buying there and hoping that they can make money But out of that. How do we you know, change the same that? The same with the cars. <laughs> no, that is that is what I'm saying. It's actually economic. There is there is a machinery that works on people to go that direction to create a want and make it like it's a need, <laughs> and and you really feel like you need it, but actually you don't. Okay. It's the want. Somebody yeah. is making profit out of. And, and it starts even at a very, you know, I have a granddaughter here and she has to watch these dolls that are films, you know, how they are dressed and all the drama is put into the brain of the kid as early as possible. And then they grow. That's what they want. So okay. it's a culture that is uh, economic, yeah. not just, a, you know, just a culture. So, yeah, we need, so we, we, we need to look at our economy. We need to look ways. at our economy, you say, and we need to change consumerism. Um I'll go to the, uh, our second question We that got uh, 14 votes and uh, it's from um, uh, Jeroen and I hope we still have time. I hope you are available 
uh, still uh, 10 more minutes panel. We are a bit late. Uh, the second question is to influence human behavior globally. How can we embed the cost of climate change in the global economy? Um, well, that's really key, actually, because as long as the price of uh, the the, uh, the the impact of our activities is not incorporated in 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 the price of of things, mm. and then uh, people will continue to um, have the behavior that Pauline uh, described and, exactly. and buy too many things and etc. Yeah. But if um, as time evolves, uh, the the cost of the impact on the environment is incorporated, uh, whether it's a carbon tax or is another way, uh, in the uh, the stuff we buy, uh, this will uh, change behavior very quickly, actually. Yes, uh, thank you. And our uh, the last yeah, yeah, question. Remember, it's a loss to someone. So the, this big guy who is selling this. Is also battling with the policymaker to make sure that that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, we go to our last uh, question uh, from the participants at home, which is also nuclear, uh, which is about nuclear. So uh, I think I'll ask Mark, um, what role will will nuclear energy play in the next decade uh, in our transition away from fossil fuels? What do you think, Mark? Uh, in the next decade, probably not much. Um, the next decades, um, maybe. Yeah, I mean, but then the next decade isn't the end of the <laughs> isn't the end of the time when we need to use energy. You've got to think about the rest of the century. Yes. Um, I'm excited about fourth generation nuclear reactors. I mean, there's designs now which can actually run entirely by burning the waste from the previous generation, and can run for you know we could put, we could run for centuries without mining a single scrap of uranium and in the process reduce the nuclear waste legacy um, and address climate change, produce lots of clean electricity, hydrogen and so on. So I think it's a technology which we need to, um, to, to re-engage with and to put more investment into. And I think people are unnecessarily scared of it. However, in the short term, I think we're looking at drastic increase in renewables um, where you know the price of solar has just gone through the floor. It's the cheapest energy option now in most in most of the world, particularly developing countries. So I, I would put most effort now into into getting renewables to be a, a sig very significant share of the, the global energy picture. And then you prefer solar, I hear, above wind. Uh, I don't think I ever said that. It depends on the context. Okay, okay. it um, depends on the yeah, context. In, in, in Bangladesh, they're looking at both solar and also a very large offshore wind farm. Um, in the Maldives, where, you know, as I mentioned, I was advising the, the government there, um, it's going to be largely solar because it's in the, it's in the close to the equator, there's very little wind. But then there's not much land either, so it has to be floating solar. So every, every you know, geographical context is, is a bit different, but renewables can certainly either contribute to or, or give the main, main share of energy in almost all of them. Um, I think we have to wrap up uh, our debate. Uh, we could uh, can uh, can I say a talk... Word? On, on this as well, can I can I make okay a quick very short well? Sergio yeah. Pascal yes because Mark uh, started uh, the, um, the the uh, the the debate tonight by saying it's an emergency and I don't think in an emergency we have the time to wait uh, for uh, four generation nuclear plants which are only on the drawing boards at the moment uh, and and we, we we might let the existing nuclear plants run for some time as long as they are safe. But if we are really in an emergency, as he said, and I agree, uh, we need to implement uh, in a massive way and as quickly as possible the technologies uh, we, we, we know work, like wind and solar. Mm -hmm. And when we know that in two houses the sun provides as much energy at the surface of the planet as the entire energy we use, all energy combined in the world, in one year, we know uh, what, uh, the, the, where the future is. So there might be some, some space in the future for, for nuclear in another form, but we mm -hmm. shouldn't wait for that uh, because, as Mark said, there is an emergency to address now. And that can be addressed with efficiency, with changes in the, the, the kind of growth we have, with a systemic approach and with a massive investment in renewable energy. 
Mm. Okay. Amen. <laughs> we say in Africa, Amen. <laughs> amen, Amen. You okay. Got it. <laughs> yes, I was talking about uh, uh, wrapping up uh, this debate. I'm um, uh, curious what uh, you at home will remember uh, from this debate. So, what is your take home message? Uh, you can. Uh, uh, you've been really active in the chat. Thanks for that. Um, uh, I hope you um, are willing to say what is your take-home message. That's the same question I'm going to ask all of you. So what is your take-home message in one or two sentences? Uh, I, that's, that's really difficult, isn't it? So, Pauline, what is your take-home message from this debate? I guess the take home is that is that uh, it, 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 uh, for, to address climate change, it needs collective efforts. You know, uh, not only it's not only a question of developed versus developing. It, we, we also still have other contradictions that make it difficult for us to act as a un, unified global society. For example, the Eastern you know world of Russia versus the the, the the Western world of it means there's always this difficulty that we in the developing world have to face two giants you know elephants coming to fight on you and you are just grass so partnership and collective and get a stage where we can trust each other so we can talk about the wealth we have and how we want to deploy it to address the issue of climate change. We have time, and that time is the period which uh, the IPCC indicates that we have already affected the climate and it will suffer for this period. And that, for me, is the period of transition. That is the time when we transit. Okay. Big transition. So that when we end that period, we are now carbon free. Okay, we, yeah, we need a global sure. transition, and you say, and we still have time. So that is your uh, take home message. Thank you, uh, Pauline. Um, uh, Mark. Um, can you think, uh, what, what will you remember from this uh, debate? What is your take-home message? Uh, my take-home message is that the global transition away from fossil fuels is already well underway. I think it's unstoppable, um, but I think the challenge now is to accelerate it so that we get to net zero early enough at a global scale to get back to the 1.5 degree trajectory that we need for the survival of, um, of the most vulnerable countries in the world. Exactly. We need to uh, uh, accelerate it um, and therefore we need solutions. So Jean-Pascal, what is your uh, take home message? Well, I agree that what we need it is what we need is to accelerate uh, the, the transition. And for that, we need the engagement of, anim of um, as many people uh, inhabiting the planet as possible. And I think the debate we had tonight shows that uh, there is value in, in, um, in debating uh, the solutions. I don't think there is any value left in debating the causes of climate change. That's a, a subtle debate. As That's not I what we the did, beginning. indeed. <laughs> but uh, to debate the solution and to engage after the debate, those who participated to that debate is absolutely needed. And to have citizen assemblies and uh, debate in many quarters uh, about uh, the world we want and the way we want to solve uh, the, um, the problems we have in, in a system approach and not only, not only in a silo approach as done in many quarters up to now, that would really help to accelerate the transition, uh, as uh, Mark mentioned. Yes, thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jean Pascal. Uh, I'll, I'd like to uh, to uh, end this debate with uh, some take-home message from the audience. Um, um Jeroen says, uh, most important is a large network to transport excess energy. Uh, Gert says, we are not going away from fossil fuels right now. Um, Clint says, there are no simple solutions. We need global cooperation on a massive scale. Um, that's true. That's true. Um, and both at the government level and at the level of individual citizens with behavior change. Well, that's a nice uh, summary maybe of the debate. Uh, thank you uh, so much for participating and asking questions and upvoting questions. I want to thank all panelists, um, uh, Jean-Paul van Ypersele, Mark Linus and Ova Pauline Dube. Thank you for uh, elaborating on solutions for uh, climate change. And also thanks uh, to Ted Nordhaus, uh, who um, 
uh, has left probably uh, because of the time. Um, I would like to thank uh, the crew from the uh, Foruit in here, uh, Martin Boudry, for organizing this event. And uh, last um, but not least, thank you again for uh, participating. Uh, I hope we all gained new insights and um, in what we should do about climate change, and I hope we are going to do it all uh, tomorrow. So stay safe and stay sustainable. I hope to see you again. Bye. Thank you, Thierry. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.